finish that book someday, but I don't know when. Um, Lord willing, of course, before the Lord returns. But at this time, I'm led to another stop as we're going to move from Mark to Paul's letter to the Philippians. I first began to look into this letter more uh, when our men's coffee fellowship began. We were meeting at Tim Hortons, and I thought it would be a great book to use as a basis for uh, our men as we seek to disciple one another, encourage one another in the Lord and in the Word. And we don't follow a strict format in that fellowship that we have together at Tim Hortons. And so Philippians has not always been the basis for a discussion, and that's fine. That's totally fine. We do have great discussions, and we learn from so many other portions of Scripture, and I, I really love it. And, and uh, if there are other men that would, are able to join with us, I know that it's during a work hour, so it's not possible for many of you, but if you're able... Invite you to come Thursdays at 11 o'clock. But as I read several times through this epistle, I was more and more brought to the conclusion that this may be one of the most needful books of the Bible for the body of Christ today. To begin, I would ask you to first open, before we go to Philippians, so to the book of Acts, which we've been reading through, to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> Just reading some of the portions from Acts chapter 16 will give us a bit of understanding what led to the church being planted and then what led Paul to later on write the epistle to them. And so we begin at verse 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrae, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. Now, Paul, the apostle, along with the, his associates like Silas, they were led by the Holy Spirit to preach in parts of the Roman Empire that had yet been untouched with the gospel. The Holy Spirit had prevented them previously from entering into these parts, but now opened the door for the gospel to be heard and the church planted. You'll recall that the call was given, come to Macedonia and help us. It was in a dream that the Lord used to call them to go in. So Paul and Silas entered into that region and then entered into Philippi. At that time, the population of that city was between 10 and 15,000. It was considered a colony. It was also considered a miniature a town or city of Rome, even though the majority of the people living there were not Roman citizens. A large population were Greeks, and a very large population were slaves, and most of those who were living in that area were just peasant farmers. There were more non-Romans than there were Romans. The minority Romans, though, were the elite. They were the ones in charge, in control. The city was in a strategic place geographically. It was the gateway uh, between Asia and the eastern part of Europe. It was also a center for religion, the worship of the goddess Artemis, also known as Diana. A large part of the uh, population, though, even those who were not Roman, they also followed another religious idolatry, which was the worship of the emperor. The worship of the emperor was seen as, as needful and necessary to be uh, allowed to live in peace there. They, they actually called in the uh, Greek language the emperor lord and savior, and uh, that he was one who they believed had brought peace 
to their part of the world. And so it is in this setting that Paul and Silas, they are called of God to enter in, and they begin to plant the seeds of the gospel. So we read on in verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. We sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now what this, first of all, tells us is that there was not a synagogue in Philippi at that time. Because of the fact that it's on that Sabbath day that they're down by the river. Uh, since Luke refers to a place of prayer by the river, verse 13, and that he just comes upon women, shows that there was no synagogue because it was at that time, and it has continued to this time, that you had to have a certain number of men to have a synagogue. And so it appears that the Jewish population in Philippi was extremely small, if in fact they even had one, because of the fact that Lydia was not a Jew. She was a, a Greek woman. Uh, as they begin to speak with this woman, Luke says that she was a worshiper of God. He uses a term, sobiame, which means a Gentile who worships Jehovah. And so she was a proselyte to the Jewish faith. In verse 13, Luke writes about her being regenerated, though. She, she was a worshiper of God, and God in his mercy sent to her the gospel, and she was born again as she heard. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things that were spoken by Paul. So she believed the message of the gospel and was baptized. Now, shortly after Lydia's conversion to Christ, Paul and Silas go back into the town in verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. This she did many days. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He came out the same hour. What a powerful display of God's kingdom over the kingdom of darkness. But it's the same power and the same mercy that was shown to Lydia by the riverside. Here there's this poor girl, and she's delivered from the evil spirit who's held her captive. And she's not only been a captive of this evil spirit, she's been, because of that, been a slave of wicked and greedy men who have used her to act as a soothsayer, a fortune teller. And due to this conversion, Paul and Silas then become persecuted. They're severely persecuted. Uh, they were beaten. Then they're put in prison. And in jail, they don't become angry. or They don't become bitter. But rather, they sing praises to God, which leads to another powerful display of God's kingdom. In verse 23, we read on from there. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fast, fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. The keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourselves no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul in silence. 
He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. So over a very short period of time, the Lord saved several people. And he did this through the preaching of the gospel down by the river to a merchant lady, the delivering of a young woman from demon possession. And after the Lord shook the earth, while prisoners sang praises to God, a jailer, along with others in his household, they were soundly saved. Then the last verse of Acts 16, Luke writes how this small church plant began to show the fruit of true faith as they opened their homes. Verse 40 says, so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. When they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. They saw the brethren, they gathered with the brethren, they encouraged the body of believers, the church, the God that established in Philippi. How beautiful is it? Among this small group, Lydia, a worshiper of God, the young girl delivered from the kingdom of darkness, and a jailer who had the night before been ready to take his own life. They gather together as a body of believers. They gather as the church. And Paul encourages them in the Lord. And then he leaves and goes on his way preaching the gospel. Let's go now to that letter that Paul then would later write to Philippians. He wrote this to this group of believers that grown in number over a short period of time. And as we read back in Acts 16, Paul faced opposition when he began preaching Jesus as Lord Savior. Again, the Romans in that city would have seen that as an attack on the Emperor of Rome. The group of believers continued to be persecuted over the years because of that. But like Paul, God sustained them. He enabled them to suffer under that persecution all for the sake of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Paul wrote this letter, he himself was a prisoner of Rome. One of the main reasons for this letter would be in response to their faithfulness, the faithfulness of the church to the Lord, their ongoing support and their encouragement to Paul during the time in which he continued to preach the gospel but even more specifically, when he was then in prison. Is this not something we find in our lives, that as we uh, find ourselves maybe in the middle of trials, middle of troubles, we have one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, whether it be from people who are far away from us, who maybe send a note or, or email us or phone us and encourage us in the Lord, or for ourselves, when we're close together, we can encourage each other through troubles and trials. It's a blessing to have faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the case of Paul and the church in Philippi, they had sent one of their own to Paul while he was in prison with a gift of support. And he makes mention of this in chapter 4, verse 18, where it says... <clears throat> Indeed, I have all, and I abound, I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. No, he just doesn't view it just as a, as a gift, but as an offering to God, as a sacrifice to God. It's pleasing to God, this gift that he's given. Goes, it, it's... it's uh, it has that sense in which he sees it as, you're giving me your very life. 
as you serve the Lord. And God is pleased in this. And so the intention of this letter to thank them for their generous gift also has other purposes and other reasonings for it. He does so by, he writes this letter in part, including what we read of in what can be considered written in a poetic form. And that's chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. It, it seems to be written in a, in a poetic form, but, but uh, not just uh, as other genres where it's not symbolic. It is very much literal in terms of its meaning. Verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now each part of the letter, each part of it is, if, if you take the chapters and you take the the, the, the chapter numbers away and the verse numbers away and you, and you study it in the form that Paul wrote it, you kind of get the idea that he had it situated in such a way or written in such a way that it was in different packages, we might call them, or different little essays, uh, sections. And we're going to take a note of these sections because each of these sections seems to all point toward this portion that we've just read. They kind of encircle it, this, this section here. And so each part of them contains things that centers on the person and the suffering and the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep this in mind as Paul writes about the suffering and the exaltation of the believers. That as we suffer, we suffer with Christ. And when we are lifted up, we'll be glorified with Christ, exalted with him. It's because of Jesus' suffering, it's because of his exaltation that all of us who name the name of the Lord Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we then too, like Paul and like the church in Philippi, we can endure suffering. That we can face suffering in this life knowing that in him, he is with us and we are with him and we will be lifted up to glory with him one day where suffering will be no more, where death will be no more, and he'll never touch us again. We'll be with the Lord Jesus forever and forever. As, as uh, the song says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. So when glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race so we see Christ. Just for this morning, as an introduction to the study of the whole letter, I'm going to divide this letter into the parts that I've mentioned, the various essays that support the truths that are found in the verses that concern the mind of Christ and his suffering and his exaltation. Uh, leading us through our suffering and soon coming exaltation with him. Though written 2,000 years ago, it is more applicable to our situation than ever, as we see in here, you know, the rising drums of anti-Christian, anti-church, anti-biblical sentiment in our Western world. The first is chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And we're not going to have time to read all these verses, but uh, I'll make note of a couple of verses as we go through them. So the first chapter, verses 1 through 11, is the first section. 
It's Paul's introductory remarks, and he lets it be known how precious the believers are to him. He shares how he remembers them in prayer. Note that in verse 3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Notice prayer is a prayer filled with joyfulness. It's a, it's a joy because of their faithfulness. It's a joy because of their steadfastness in the gospel, in the face of the opposition from the world around them. You see, they've not surrendered to the pressures from their culture or their society in which they live. They've not fallen back or they've not gone and hidden in the shadows seeking to make the gospel more appealing to the human senses. They have continued on being partners in the gospel work, even if it meant persecution, even if it meant imprisonment, even if it meant death as a martyr. This must be said of us, brothers and sisters. While, while many are surrendering to the catcalls of society, doing so because of, you know, there, there's this desire of some that they, they want to have the world love and accept us, so we must give in to them. We must give them what will make them love us. But we're not called to that. We are called to be faithful to the one who has called us out of the world, recognizing that the world is going to hate us for it. Jesus promised us that. Our calling is not to make the gospel appealing to the world so that the world will not oppose us. Our calling is to make the gospel known, knowing the world will oppose. And Paul testified of their faithfulness with him while in prison, verse, in verse 7, where he talks about how they continued with him for the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. And along with this, Paul, he gives to the believers the hope and the promise of God through all of this in verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We say that no matter what the world throws at you, no matter how light or strong the opposition to the gospel, the believer in Jesus Christ can rest in the faithfulness of God to accomplish his work in you and in me. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He chose us. He called us. He wooed us. He saved us. And he will bring us through the floods. He'll bring us through the fires. And he will bring us to the finish line. He started the work in you and in me. And so rest assured, he will bring the work into completion. One day you will be and I will be with Christ and we will be like Christ. And we will share with him in the inheritance of glory. And then chapter 1, verses 12 through 26 is the second section. And this much, like the, this, like much of his letter, the rest of his letter, is very personal. Paul wrote very personal. It wasn't just technical terms. He didn't just write a, a worksheet. He has a desire to comfort the church as they hear about, not their imprisonment per se, but his imprisonment. He's, he's greatly concerned that they're overwrought with concern because he suffered. And so being a prisoner of Rome, we know it would be no picnic. Yes, we know there were a few short years that the Apostle Paul, as a prisoner of Rome, was in a rented house. In fact, he himself had to rent it. Uh, they didn't provide him with a house. But for that period, it was like house arrest. But the majority of time that Paul was in prison, it wasn't in a nice house. It would be in, like in Philippi. It would be in, a, in stocks. It would be a, a dark, damp, dirty, rat-infested prison. And so you can understand why the believers in Philippi and others who knew Paul would have been very concerned for him. But Paul does not want them to be overwrought with, with concern. 
He's concerned about their concern. And so what Paul writes might be considered a paradox. What seems to be a bad situation, Paul writes and shows that God has turned it out for good. Just because he's in prison doesn't mean that the gospel has been imprisoned. In fact, his imprisonment, he says, has been the means of the gospel going out further. Note this in verse 12. Verse 12 of chapter, chapter 1. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifested in all the palace and in all other places, and many of the brethren in the Lord wax confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Is this how you see it when troubles arise as a Christian? As a church body, do we, do we look at the challenges, the difficulties, maybe start to worry, get anxious? Or do we see what Paul sees? Do we see God using everything? Everything, even the bad. No, even those that were preaching to make it harder on Paul, they, they were doing it for the wrong reason. He still says, I'm rejoicing because whatever way the gospel is going forth, to see the kingdom of God growing in the world, to see the gospel going out further, is what brings comfort to Paul. And he gives that comfort to the Philippian believers. Sometimes we view the work of the kingdom as a battle of chess, where Jesus, he makes a move, and the devil loses a pawn, and the devil makes a move, and the Lord loses a pawn, and keeps going back and forth. You know, that's a very sad, depressing way to look at it. I'm not saying chess is depressing. But to look at it, it's if Jesus is in a kind of a struggle. He's losing one. He's winning one. He's losing one. He's winning one. That, that is a depressing way to look at it. But the Apostle Paul, he saw the victory of the gospel in every move. Every move. Even his own imprisonment and death. He saw it as a means that God was using to build his church. In verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. What a confident hope. Well, the third one is chapter 1, verse 27, to chapter 2, verse 18. And the main thrust of this section is the call to live the life of a believer, an example to the life of Christ. To have the same mind as Jesus as we love him and love one another in the church body. In verse 27 of chapter 1, it says, Only let your conduct... Be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We've not only been called to believe the gospel, we've been called to live the gospel. The Christians in Philippi heard the gospel. And they believed in what could be called a hotbed of Roman patriotism, where 
again, they worshiped the emperor. They called him Lord and Savior. They knew from the start that to live the gospel, to have the mind of Christ was completely opposite and opposed to the, the prevailing mindset of the Roman idolaters. These idolaters' lives, it was shaped by their allegiance and service to the emperor. But the believers were called out of that. They were called now to live their lives shaped by their allegiance to another emperor, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, this would bring persecution because the Romans did not take that lightly. The emperor did not take that lightly. And so persecution was inevitable. But the believers, they were called upon to make a bold confession of faith and in light of the cost, live their lives for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, King Jesus. And to do so with the understanding that the call to follow Jesus is not simply saying I'm a Christian, but it is a life that is associated with the living Jesus. And that means to be now dead to self and alive to Christ, which leads to a willingness and a readiness to suffer with him so that we might be exalted with him and to do so united in him, united as one in Christ. And that's so wonderfully given in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, which we have already read. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The next section is chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, which gives an example of this very thing. He gives the example of Timothy and also of Epaphroditus. Timothy and in uh, chapter 2, verse 19 through 24, is given an example of having the mind of Christ as he cares for the needs of others. And Epaphroditus, who was sent by the Philippian church to bring gifts to Paul in prison, he was shown to have put himself under possible persecution, suffering for the sake of the gospel by connecting himself to Paul as well as leading to his own physical suffering. Now we see this where in chapter two, verse 30, he says, because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. The point being that the, these were two examples of living Breathing examples of Jesus, of those having the mind of Christ, who humbly gave up their lives for others, just as Jesus gave up his life for us. Now, chapter 3 is its own section. Chapter 3 is Paul's personal example of then having the mind of Christ. So he gave the example of Timothy, he gives the example of, of uh Epaphroditus, and now he gives himself an example. He shares his own testimony in this chapter, chapter 3, of God's grace when he was humble before God, when he was made to see all his past ways, all his past thoughts were worthless, especially as it pertained to his desire to be accepted by God. Like Jesus who humbled himself. Know what he wrote in chapter 3. Again at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Those five words. I pray that that would be the desired prayer of our hearts, that I may gain Christ. Paul states that he has given up all his past, 
everything, all that he depended on for the sake of gaining Christ, knowing Christ. He does not desire the cause of the world anymore. I'm sure he did as a Pharisee. He doesn't seek for immortality through his own efforts, religious and otherwise, which again he pursued through the law and as a Pharisee. All these things he sees them now as garbage, rubbish. His full desire is that I may gain Christ. To know Christ. To make Christ known. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. In verse 20 of chapter 3, he writes, For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. His desire is that while he is living and breathing and preaching, that he knows Christ and gains Christ and makes Christ known, but he also has that anticipation of one day seeing Christ when he comes. And he eagerly awaits from knowing that his citizenship isn't as a Roman. His citizenship is of heaven. And that whatever he faces as a Roman citizen is nothing in comparison to the glory awaiting him when he sees a Savior face to face. And so then in chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, it's the sixth section, Paul exhorts the believers to continue on waiting for that day, the day of the Lord's return, to do so in the unity of the faith and without fear. In chapter 4, verse 1, he writes, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Unia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And then dropping down to verse 6, he writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So how, did, how, how do we do this? How do we, as we wait for the day of the Lord, how do we do so in the unity of faith and without fear? We do so by focusing on what is the mind of Christ, not the world. If you're like me, it's easy to spend time focusing on the things of this world. And he writes in verse 11, teaching us what we should be thinking about. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. He uses the same terminology, meditate, as as used throughout to talk about meditating on the Word of God. Meditating on eating the Word of God. Digesting and redigesting. You're going through the truths, the, the things that are of Christ, the things that are beautiful. And then finally, verses 10 through 23 of chapter 4 is the last section. And in this section, Paul expresses his deep thankfulness. And there's a thankfulness to the church body, the church family, for their love and for their support. But he doesn't simply say thank you and goodbye. He seeks to make it clear to his brothers and sisters in the faith that the struggles, the persecutions he has faced, that he's presently experiencing have been God's means of teaching him personally. He brings out what has been a focus of persecutions and troubles have been brought to strengthen the church body, to have the word of God go out further, and now he brings it right to himself. He shows how that what he's experiencing is 
is brought about by God to sanctify him. In verse 12, he says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Think of this, brothers and sisters. If this was written to us, personally written to us, as it was written to the Philippian church, written to us sovereign, to the church that calls itself Sovereign Grace Baptist that meets in Valley Christian School. If it was written like that as a personal letter to us, what would it say to us and about us? Would he be reminding us that in trials we are being prayed for and that God will be faithful and complete the work he began in us? He won't give up. He will complete it. Both in its personal, individual thing that for you as a Christian, you've been saved by grace, whatever you pass through in this life, there is a day where you will be perfect like Christ. Why do we get anxious <laughs> when we know the end result will be great? Even as a church body, the Lord will complete its work. Even at times where you know, we've gone through a couple of years of difficulty with the COVID issues, we, we have people in our body that are sick, I want to say something just off the top of my heart here. You know, I am so thankful to see Betty Noah. You know, it was 38 years ago, almost 40 years ago, that God brought a small group of people into a house out in, um, out in Dudney area who had come out of some affliction and trouble and division in the church. And the little church was born. And uh, Daddy Noah was one of the first. And what that shows to me and reminds me of is the fact and seeing such a dear faithful lady that the Lord has preserved sovereign grace through many trials and afflictions. So thank you, Betty. Love you. Yeah. Because I say that because Betty and I are the only ones here today <coughs> that were in that living room almost 40 years ago. But the Lord has continued to bring us together, his body. And I've gone off track, but you understand what I'm saying. The Lord is the one who is in control. The Lord is the one who began a good work in us. And he will complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. Paul was led to write this letter to remind the believers to keep growing, to keep learning more about Christ and the way in which the church is to be in the world, to learn even more what it means to be joyful in Christ, to be humble like Christ, to serve Christ and his church with a giving and a contented heart and mind, even when the world doesn't welcome us. These are lessons that we are all learning. We will continue to learn and be sanctified in them and mature up in them until Christ comes again. And then we will be made perfect like him. Until that day, until that day, let's seek to follow the instructions given in chapter 3, verse 14. 
press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And in doing so, while we press on, let us follow and humbly believe and trust in the Savior and seek to have the mind of Christ. Because in this, we will be a people of joy, humility, and contentment in Christ Jesus our Lord, and he will build his church, a faithful church, because of a faithful God. Let us pray. Our Father, our God, our Lord, we bow before you and we thank you, Lord, that we are not the ones building the church you are. We're not the ones saving souls you are. It's not even us, Lord, that are able in our, ourselves to, to stand up and to endure and carry on and grow in, in Christ Jesus. It's only the work of the Spirit of God. You work in us to both will and do of your good pleasure. So we pray, Lord, that we would be people rejoicing and thankful for the work you have begun in us, which you will complete. Oh Lord, give us the mind of Christ. May we not be focused upon this world. We'll set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. We pray, Lord, that whether you take us to glory through death or we're here on the day that Jesus comes and be raised with him. Father, we pray that we will be those who truly sing that song from our hearts that it's worth it all when we see Jesus. How we thank you and we praise you for these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.